So hi everyone, I'm Rebecca. Thank you so much for coming out of Steph Lake today. Um, and so I actually just interviewed on the West Coast and I found out that um, I walk too fast and I speak too fast for the West Coast and have to stay on the East Coast. So if I'm speaking too quickly, um, just let me know. But so this talk is going to be about sexual and reproductive health at Mount Sinai. Um, and the objectives, uh, so I learned how to write objectives thanks to Dr. Soriano. By the end of the session, uh, participants will be able to, one, list a few reasons why sexual health is important to teach in medical school, describe how Sinai students view their knowledge about sexual, uh, specific sexual and reproductive health topics, um, and I'm going to spend most of my time on that objective, and then also begin to propose ways to improve sexual health education in medical school curriculum. And just briefly, um, so I'm going to go over just a brief definition of sexual health so we're all on the same page, and then talk about why even care about sexual health education when there's so much other things to learn in medical school. Uh, I'm going to spend most of my time on a student survey about sexual and reproductive health education and at Mount Sinai. I'll talk briefly about some student-led curricular efforts, and then um, talk about some suggestions to move forward, and hopefully I'll leave some time so that there's questions and also have a discussion about um, the data and about moving forward. So first, who am I? Many of you know me. Many of you have helped me in many, many ways and taught me a lot. I am a fourth-year um, MD, MPH student, and um, for my MPH thesis, I uh, talked, I'm researching sexual and reproductive health education in medical school, specifically the survey at Mount Sinai. I also uh, co-founded last year uh, the AMSA National Sexual Health Scholars Program, which is an online sexual health course for medical students run through AMSA. And then this year, with some people who are in the room, I uh, co-directed the Sex and Health Elective at Mount Sinai, and I'll briefly talk about that at the end. So here's the definition of sexual health, and I'm going to read it from the World Health Organization. Sexual health is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. And I just want to spend a moment to focus on this definition of sexual health um, because of its more holistic framework. Uh, this definition focuses more on this sex-positive idea about sex and sexuality. And I would argue, as do many people who are examining sexual and reproductive health education in medical schools across the U.S., that too often the sexual health curriculum focuses only on disease, so HIV, AIDS, sexually transmitted infections, or on pre pregnancy prevention or on pregnancy, and doesn't really focus on, um, on well-being in relation to sexuality. So throughout, throughout the talk, um, just think about this definition as the one that I'm hopefully using. So why is this a health issue? Um, here's one example. Um, in the uh, online sexual health course that I helped teach, we had a session about sexuality and aging. Um, and the students had to write reflection papers about the readings, um, and specifically about uh, older adults and sexuality. And this is one of the students, this is in her words, and I asked permission to use this here. My grandmother was recently taken to the emergency department for syncope. She was found to be severely dehydrated, and the doctors did not ask a complete sexual history, and they did not understand why this was so. After questioning and coaxing from my aunt, we discovered that the reason my grandmother was so severely dehydrated is because she did not want a full bladder during sex. It made her feel like she was going to pee. And this was the first any of us knew of her sexual activity with her boyfriend. And sadly, nobody had bothered to get a sexual history, so nobody had the opportunity to counsel her on or treat her urinary symptoms. Luckily, she was fine once she was rehydrated, but the potential for severe health repercussions was present, and should a patient not have a family as vigilant about their health, they might suffer significant medical problems. Now, I chose this uh, quote just because it's so easily pain. This is just a reflection paper that, that we hadn't asked for examples. We were just asking them to reflect on the readings, and already one of the students came about, um, was talking about this. And when you talk with people, oftentimes there are uh, stories like this, and uh, too often it's because you don't hear about this, and because providers don't think to ask a sexual history, or oftentimes they're embarrassed and not trained enough about it. And I'll talk more about training of healthcare providers uh, in a moment. 
So these are a few surveys, and 94% of patients have stated in one survey that sexual enjoyment is important in their lives, which makes a lot of sense. 71% in that same survey said that they were afraid to discuss sexual concerns with their physician for fear that either the doctor would ignore them or just dismiss these concerns, or that their doctor would get embarrassed. Um, and yet, many want physicians to ask them about their sexual lives. Patients don't want to initiate the conversation, they want the physician to initiate. In terms of sex being a patient concern, one uh, major survey uh, so, uh, was looking at sexual dysfunction um, in, in adults aged 18 to 59. So in that survey, 43% of women and 31% of men had a sexual dysfunction. And what that means is that um, is sexual problems included problems with desire, arousal, orgasm, or pain, and were often secondary to other medical conditions. And just remember that in that statistic, that's, that only goes up to age 59. Um, and other studies have shown that dysfunction is even greater in geriatric patients. There's an estimated 17 million prescriptions for erectile dysfunction annually, and those are only the people who feel comfortable enough to go to their doctor and ask. And uh, some studies have shown that untreated sexual problems have an association with decreased quality of life, depression, and medication non-adherence. And of course, you all know that sex is a public health issue. So, there are increasing rates of STIs. All of this data comes from the CDC. So, um, in 2009, there were 409 cases of chlamydia per 100,000 population. Rates of syphilis continue to increase in subpopulations. And of the one million people estimated living with HIV, one-fifth is unaware of the infection. Uh, there's high rates of teen pregnancy as well. So uh, in 2009, there were 39.1 births to 1,000 teen women. And there's unacceptable rates of uh, sexual violence. So according to the CDC, uh, which tends to be a really conservative estimate, 11% of women report having experienced forced sex in their lifetime. So the question, now that we know that sex is clearly a concern for patients and it's clearly a public health concern, um, what are physicians doing? Uh, on average, according to different studies, only 25% of physicians take a sexual history from patients some or all of the time. And then the question is, um, what is included in this sexual history? So one study actually looked at what physicians were asking and they found that often not asked is uh, whether the patient has a history of sexual abuse uh, what the patient's sexual practices are, what are they actually doing when they say sex, and what are partner sexual practices. And when, they, when they're asked, physicians are asked, so why don't you take a sexual history? They often report um, that they feel embarrassed, that they feel ill-prepared, that uh, the sexual history is not relevant to the chief complaint, time constraints, and overwhelmingly they say that there's a lack of training. And I would also argue that embarrassment and feeling ill-prepared uh, probably comes with uh, because of a lack of training. And one study uh, that came out last year or this year uh, found that medical students are six times more likely to feel comfortable discussing sexual uh, health with patients if they feel that they've been adequately trained in sexual health. Okay, so now what is happening in, in other schools. So I'm going to talk a lot, uh, for most of the time about what students think about our school, but I just want you to uh, compare with other schools. So there's a few studies out there they're not the greatest studies, but they're kind of what we have. And one study looked at U.S. and Canadian medical schools. And what they found is that half teach between three to 10 hours about human sexuality across the four-year program. Uh, fewer than one-third of those schools offered a formal human sexuality course. However, one-third of schools didn't even respond. So what we're left with is, um, of the schools that, that did not respond, does that mean that they're doing nothing? We have no idea. And then the other question is, um, what are schools teaching? And I'll show you a study in a sec. Um, quick side note, which I just think is fascinating, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is when they compared the U.S. and Canada um, in terms of curriculum, what they found is that U.S. focuses almost entirely on um, knowledge and skills based, whereas Canada focuses on knowledge, skills, and then also a, um, a, a really big examination of attitudes. So another study looked at um, preclinical medical education, and they surveyed uh, U.S. schools, 77% of U.S. schools were surveyed, and I'm going to focus just on the Northeast data because that's more com comparable to us. 
Um, and of that, uh, the response rate was 66% from Northeast schools. They found that for less controversial topics, over 95% talk about STIs and about pregnancy. Um, but for the more controversial topics, 87% talk about intimate partner violence, 61% talk about sexual violence, uh, far fewer, 57% talk about LGBT health. And then with contraception, almost all the schools talk about oral contraceptives, 61% uh, taught about medication abortion, and then 39% taught about surgical abortion, specifically in the first four term. Okay, so here's Mount Sinai, a Mount Sinai survey. Um, and briefly, this was sponsored uh, by the survey and kind of the entire project, which was uh, happening at other schools as well, uh, was sponsored by Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health, CURSE, uh, AMSA, and Medical Students for Choice. And the principal investigator for this survey is uh, Dr. Jacobs, who unfortunately can't be here today because I believe he's uh, doing surgeries all day. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to all the other medical students who were uh, actively involved with this project uh, during the course. The research questions were twofold. The first was to evaluate Mount Sinai medical student knowledge and perceived knowledge about various sexual health topics. So for example, how do students view their own knowledge? And then we also had a few questions, 12 questions at the end, which were uh, quiz-based uh, actual knowledge questions. The second question was to explore students' comfort levels about sexual health topics and about certain populations. How do students feel comfortable around these topics or with these certain patients? Uh, this was a cross-sectional quantitative survey. It was IRB exempt. Uh, and it was an internet-based survey. Um, it was sent to second, third, and fourth year medical students in the spring and summer of 2009. So basically, when I'm giving you uh, the results, think about that uh, the fourth year students had, were beginning or had just begun their fourth year of medical school. Um, and so the questions, the perceived knowledge and comfort questions were primarily Likert scale. And then for the actual knowledge, it was in, uh, which was 12 survey questions at the end, it was a mixture of multiple choice and then check all that applies. The quiz questions, we tried to find as many questions as we could from the actual literature. There's not much out there. So what we did was a mixture of specific questions we could find in surveys that had been published, as well as finding uh, questions, creating questions based on literature. And so here's the results. Um, generally, 137 students from years two through four responded with a response rate of approximately 35%. And for the, for the rest of the results, I'm going to focus only on year four. Um, for two reasons. The first is that the response rate is much higher, 50%. And then more importantly is that um, what I understand is that almost all of the curriculum of uh, sexual and reproductive health happens in the first three years. So what you can pretty much assume is that by fourth year, they will have already gotten the formal curriculum and anything else is whatever um, they've gotten from electives elsewhere, more or less. Um, for characteristics for fourth year, 66% were female, which is overrepresentative. Um, it's much more even in the actual class. And then this was anticipated specialties. So uh, this is a sample. They were allowed to check all that apply. Um, so some people might have still been not sure. 31% uh, were going to go into internal medicine, 5 into OBGYN, 10% into surgery, and 31% into pediatrics. And of course, others chose other specialties as well. Um, internal medicine is slightly overrepresentative and uh, overrepresented in the survey as are its teens. OBGYN and surgery is pretty much more or less on par. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Much more. Yeah. Um, so here's the general results. Um, the questions were, you know. Um, how important do you think it is to learn about sexual and reproductive in medical school? Um, everyone said that it's important, they're very important. And then most students also said that uh, their knowledge about sexual health and reproductive health issues has increased from beginning medical school to now. And their comfort level also, 91% uh, said that that has increased from beginning to medical school to now as well. And so for the next few slides, I'm going to show you various topics. I decided to focus on topics. So. Um, you'll see reproductive physiology, sexual and reproductive pathophysiology, disease, contraception, abortion, sexual violence, sexuality, and aging, identity, so specifically lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, LGBT, and then also disabilities. 
Um, and here is, in terms of uh, perceived knowledge, so how do students view their knowledge about uh, reproductive physiology? And it's a little busy, so I want to focus more first on the green side, um, on the left. And the, so the, the I'm just going to point here. So right here, so you'll see this on almost every single slide when I have graphs. And I kind of decided that by fourth year, 90% of fourth year should feel knowledgeable about these topics. So I basically always have this dotted line on top so you can compare. And generally for reproductive physiology, for puberty, menstruation, pregnancy, and menopause, most did. Um, it ranged from 81% at, at menopause to 93% of students felt knowledgeable about pregnancy. Um, more generally, they felt knowledgeable about female and uh, reproductive and sexual health, although only two-thirds felt comfortable or felt knowledgeable about male reproductive and sexual health. The numbers are low. Um, and then for actual knowledge, um, 86% correctly answered about a question about ovulation, specifically when can a woman, in a, when is a woman more likely to be pregnant? And 99% um, said that they feel comfortable discussing physiologic processes with patients. We're going to move on to pathophysiology, in which case you see that the numbers are already uh, lower. So if you remember from the previous slide, 80 to 90% or even more felt knowledgeable about physiologic processes. Here, about 60 to 70 percent felt knowledgeable about female and male sexual dysfunction, and those numbers were much more um, were on par with each other uh, versus the previous slide, with treatment of common, common sexual concerns and also sexual side effects of um, medications. And then we asked the survey uh, quiz question assessing actual knowledge, um, and 78 percent correctly answered a question about side effects of a med medication. However, of the fourth year, 17% reported that they don't know. Uh, the question itself was whether a specific beta blocker can cause erectile dysfunction in men. Uh, so it was actually pretty, fairly simple. Moving on to disease, uh, and disease, if you remember, is uh, HIV AIDS and sexually transmitted infections. And over here, students felt very knowledgeable and very comfortable. They felt knowledgeable about these diseases. They felt comfortable discussing um, counseling of, about prevention against STIs. And then there's a question about chlamydia, and almost all fourth years correctly answered the question. So we're going to move on to contraception. And here, um, and I'm not going to talk about emergency contraception yet. Over 90%, again, feel uh, that they feel knowledgeable about the most of the different types of contraception. Um, and then also they feel comfortable counseling patients about pregnancy prevention. So for example, they felt comfortable talking and they're knowledgeable about oral contraceptives, condoms, IUDs, tubal ligation, vasectomy. Almost all students also correctly answered a question about teens' access to contraceptive services. Uh, it was a question about confidentiality for teens. And then 86% correctly identified that birth control pills are more effective than condoms, than male condoms in preventing pregnancy. Now, it was slightly different when we talk about emergency contraception and abortion. Still, students felt very knowledgeable, or, or uh, said that they felt knowledgeable about both emergency contraception, surgical, and medical abortion. Um, but then, for the quiz question, that was different. Uh, there was one question about um, abortion medications, and what I basically asked is I gave three medications, um, two abortion medications and, uh, that can be used for abortion, and then Plan B, which is emergency contraception, and said, please check all the all of the above, uh, whichever you uh, whichever are can be used for abortion. So 90% correctly named one of the two abortion medications. Only 69% were able to name both of them. And then 31% of uh, fourth year medical students uh, checked off that Plan B is also an abortion medication. There was also a question about emergency contraception. And uh, this is the one question that I think was actually um, probably ambiguously understood by the students. So it was, it was phrased as emergency contraception with Plan B can be initiated up to blank days after unprotected intercourse. So the answer is actually five days, which is 10%. But I think that the reason that um, so many people said three days is because uh, they probably understood that it is most effective up to three, uh, up to three days. 
Um, so we would change that for next time. But 12% still responded that it can only be initiated um, in fewer than three days. For violence, um, Sarah I only discuss uh, perceived comfort. So how are fourth year students uh, feeling comfortable about discussing these topics with a patient? And for sexual assault, uh, okay. uh, for sexual assault, 59% uh, felt that they were, um, that they felt comfortable about discussing these topics with a patient. But a notable um, amount, 19%, felt uncomfortable even talking about these topics with a patient. And for intimate partner violence, the numbers were fairly similar. Uh, with, when it's knowledge about these topics, almost no student said that they felt not knowledgeable about uh, sexual assault or ITV, um, but they still, there's a large number who felt uh, only somewhat knowledgeable about these two topics. There was a question about ITV in New York State law, and 85% uh, correctly answered that question. So for the next few slides, this is where I think um, many more students feel uncomfortable or not knowledgeable about these topics. So this is perceived knowledge about sexuality in adolescents and then sexuality in the elderly. For sexuality in, the, in adolescents, 72% said that they felt knowledgeable and 28% somewhat knowledgeable. But when we move to sexuality in the elderly, um, Far fewer felt knowledgeable or somewhat knowledgeable, and then 12% also felt not knowledgeable about these topics. And just an aside, I always find this really interesting because we have an amazing geriatrics department, and, we, and I'll talk more about this. So I thought that this was especially surprising to me. Um, when this was perceived comfort about discussing sexual and reproductive health topics with the following patients. So, um, here it's about uh, how comfortable do you feel talking with children, talking with adolescents, and then talking with the elderly. And I know that people uh, think it's weird to talk about sexuality with, with children. Um, I included that because there are many different topics that you should talk about with children, um, such as um, you know even talking about puberty and also talking about good touch, bad touch, and other things. So I want to compare this with just females and males. So, when you just look at, do you feel comfortable talking about sexual and reproductive health with females and with males, almost everyone said yes, they do. But then when you compare it to, for example, um, at the elderly, they feel much less uh, comfortable talking about these topics with the elderly. Um, so we're going to move on. And uh, if you have questions about any of these slides, I can also move back towards them. I know there's a ton of information. Uh, this is identity, sexual and gender. Uh, so I'm specifically talking about bisexual health, gay health, lesbian health, and transgender health. And if you see here, um, the top line was the 90% line that I posted kind of every um, on each slide. And here, fewer than 50% felt knowledgeable about any of these topics. And with transgender health, it was even less. So perceived knowledge ranged from 40% for bisexual and lesbian health to um, only 26% for transgender health, with even more people feeling not knowledgeable about transgender health. And when we asked about knowledge, uh, when we actually asked survey questions or quiz questions about sexual identities, um, there, there, there were um, some, some questions were easier than others. And, and so the first is this question about behavior versus identity, uh, which is pretty important. The question was, uh, a man whose or sexual orientation is heterosexual can be sexually active with, and then it was with women, with men, and you could check off. And so 93% correctly responded that a heterosexual man can be sexually active with women. But far fewer, 60%, also responded that this man could be sexually active with, with men. There was a question about biphobia, and the specific question was, bisexuals are gay and lesbian individuals who do not come out because they are fearful of social stigma and oppression. 83% um, said that that was incorrect, so that is a wrong, a false statement, and then 9% said that they, had, that they did not know. And the last question I asked about sexual identities was about preventive medicine for lesbians. 72% um, correctly answered that lesbians should have half smears but 28% did not uh, answer correctly for this question. Uh, this is another busy slide. I will explain this to you. 
Um, so on the top, there's going to be two categories. The first is comfort interacting with the following patients. Interacting just with someone who is a gay patient. And then on the right, it's perceived comfort about discussing sexual and reproductive health topics with the following patients. So on the left, if you see, for bisexual gays and lesbians, fourth-year medical students at Mount Sinai feel almost entirely comfortable just interacting with these patients. Um, slightly less comfortable, about 80% uh, about comfortable, 80% uh, of students feel comfortable interacting with transgender patients. And very few feel uncomfortable interacting with transgender patients. But when you talk about uh, discussing sexual and reproductive health topics with these patients, uh, far fewer feel comfortable. Um, and it uh, ranges, uh, so it's about 70 to 80% for bisexual gays and lesbians, and far fewer, about 50%, feel comfortable talking with uh, transgender patients about their sexual and reproductive health. And then the last uh, topic is disabilities. And I left it vague um, for students. Um, disabilities could mean um, a mixture of uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, diabetes, ha um, having had an MI. And the question was, how comfortable do you, discuss, do you feel discussing sexual and reproductive health topics with a disabled patient? 52% felt comfortable, 31% were neutral, and then 17% felt uncomfortable. So, why, so when students wrote that they felt less than, when, that they felt uncomfortable about a specific topic, um, why? And I had students, um, they could list their own, um, their own reasons, but really I took these uh, ideas from the literature, from established literature. 71% of students um, felt that they just didn't have sufficient knowledge about the topic. 67% said that they had no experience, and 57% said that they had, uh, didn't have sufficient training, or they had just never met a patient like this. And then fewer said that it was, a lack, it was due to a lack of positive role modeling um, or because of embarrassment. And then only 9% said that they felt uncomfortable because of their own personal beliefs. And our, I would argue that you know, much of what this comes down to is basically um, lack of sufficient knowledge or lack of sufficient training when they felt uncomfortable about a topic. And so I love this slide because I'm a fourth year medical student and it totally makes sense to me. Um, this is comparing second, third, and fourth year medical students, and how often do they uh, think that they take sexual histories? So second and third years are much more likely to say that they always or frequently take sexual histories, whereas fourth years, um, still pretty good, say that they either frequently or sometimes take sexual histories. And I just think it's funny how quickly it goes down. Um, reasons that students listed for not always taking a sexual history. Um, most of them said that the sexual history is not relevant to chief complaints or because of time constraints. And very few, only 5% said it was either due to a lack of training or embarrassment. So there are clearly several limitations to the study, and I know that you probably have others. I'm only going to list um, or highlight three. Uh, the first is the response rate. The uh, response rate uh, was 31% for the second, third, and fourth years and 50%, so still low for uh, only fourth year students. Um, it's still within the range of acceptable response rates, but it's low. Um, respondents are more likely to be female um, in the survey, in responses to the survey than, resp than people in actual class. Um, and then also, is students assess knowledge and comfort an accurate measure? And this is an, inter an important question. So you saw that with emergency contraception, students feel really knowledgeable about this, but, uh, or abortion, but they don't necessarily know. And it could be vice versa. So I think that what's important for all of the graphs that I showed you is comparisons. So students um, feel very knowledgeable about reproductive physiology, but less uh, knowledgeable about LGBT health. And that's kind of the way that I've been looking at this data. Um, so to summarize, um, and this is just from what I've learned from uh, people in, in all the curriculum, is that there are more course hours um, at Mount Sinai for sexual and reproductive health, devoted to sexual and reproductive health, than in other medical schools. Um, that's overall. Curricular areas of strength, according to the survey, are sexual and reproductive physiology, disease, HIV, AIDS, and STIs, and also most types of contraception. Um, areas where there could be improvement are in male sexual and reproductive health, uh, it seems like female students feel knowledgeable about sexual pathophysiology in both males and females, 
sexual violence and intimate partner violence. And what I've been told um, uh, is that there's actually, um, since the students took the survey, there's now a case about intimate partner violence um, in the ambulatory care clerkship. Um, emergency contraception and abortion could also be areas for improvement. And then I said this notable areas for improvement is um, sexuality and aging, especially in geriatrics, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health, so all of those um, groups, and then also sexuality and disabilities. And one of my questions is, you know, do we need less emphasis on awareness and more on facts? So this is kind of coming from my own experience as a medical student at this school. Um, we have an amazing geriatric department, as I said. Um, and we're, at least for my class, we've always been told that older adults have sex, and we should ask them about their sexual activity. So we know this. This is awareness. And my question is, um, is it that, that we just feel uncomfortable because we've never really been taught about sex? So, for example, there's so many issues happening with older adults. There's menopause. There's vaginal sinus after menopause. There's erectile dysfunction. There's issues with nursing homes. Um, and maybe what we need to do is kind of transition from the awareness to facts. The same thing with LGBT health. It sounds like students are very not, um, comfortable around LGBT patients, but they feel much less knowledgeable about certain topics. Um, so this is clearly a work in progress. Um, and, you know, as you already saw, um, things are constantly being added in. There's now, now a new case in the ambulatory care clerkship. Um, sexual and reproductive health topics are addressed throughout preclinical and clinical years with material added in annually. And from what I understand, and I'm not involved with curriculum uh, at Mount Sinai, but what I understand is that it's a curriculum without walls, which means that um, there's a sexual, health, sexual and reproductive health topics are um, Lectures are kind of taught in various different classes across um, across at least the three years. Um, so there's not a specific sexual health course, but there's many topics throughout. Um, and student groups are already addressing some of these gaps, and some of the students are already are here. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point out, if you don't already know about what's happening on the student level, is vagina monologues was I think I'm, I'm started last year. And this year, they have, around the vagina monologues, they have events about preventing sexual violence, and then also events about enhancing sexual pleasure. And what I love that is because it's really going towards this whole idea about the well-being of sexuality. You're talking about the whole spectrum with these events. Um, Stonewall Alliance is having a symposium in a few months about um, gay use and suicide and what healthcare professionals should do. And then the sexual health group um, is, and other students are um, organized a sex and health elective. And so this happened. This just finished this past uh, fall. It was the first, um, the first of hopefully many years. It was 10 sessions, and it was adopted from AMSA Sexual Health Scholars Program, as well as the Curriculum for Healthcare Professionals that's been published through Morehouse School of Medicine's Center of Excellence for Sexual Health. And the goal was to both increase both uh, skills, specifically sexual history taking skills, and knowledge about sexual and reproductive health topics, and also examine attitudes. So we had a mixture of lectures and small group discussions. And topics range from sexual anatomy to sexuality and aging to LGBT health, common sexual concerns and treatments, alternative sex, um, which is more focused on paraphilias and uh, BDSM and other topics. Um, 15 participants uh, were in the course. And just to give you a, uh, uh, some of the survey data is that 95% agreed that the sessions increased their sexual health knowledge, and 78% uh, disagreed that topics taught in the elective had already been covered in the Mount Sinai curriculum. Um, and just briefly, the present and future goals. So this was a, uh, a, twin, a twin program. So we also had an elective at Tulane Medical School. Um, and the goal is to hopefully create a um, finalize this curriculum and distribute it to other medical schools where students are really interested in these topics. And of course, we're hoping um, to sustain this elective at Mount Sinai um, in next fall. But if you see, only 15 per uh, participants finished the, third, finished, finished the course. And these are already probably people who were already interested enough in this topic. So the question is, if students don't learn this material during medical school, when are they going to learn it? And especially the difficult topics, which are the topics that are controversial, um, LGBT health, abortion, uh, things that people don't really talk too much about, sexual violence and intimate partner violence. So here's where, for the educators in the room who are not students, 
this is what I think is a call to action for everyone here. Um, if you don't know, Dr. David Sasser is the former is a former Surgeon General, and he published a call to action to promote sexual health and responsible sexual behavior. So he published this in 2001, and think about him talking directly to Mount Sinai. Um, we need to appreciate the diversity of our culture, engage in mature, thoughtful, and respectful discussion, be informed by the science that is available to us, and invest in continued research. And this is a call to action. We cannot remain complacent. Doing nothing is unacceptable. Our efforts not only will have an impact on the current health status of our citizens, but will lay a foundation for a healthier society in the future. And he uh, goes on later to talk about health care providers and about training. Health care providers typically do not receive adequate training in sexual aspects of health and disease and taking sexual history. Ideally, curriculum content should seek to decrease anxiety and personal difficulty with the sexual aspects of health care, increase knowledge, of, uh, increase awareness of personal biases, and increase tolerance and understanding of the diversity of sexual expression. So here's some ideas that I had, and this is almost the end, about specific ways that we could, um, that we can move forward. Um, and then I'm interested in hearing your, your comments as well. Um, so purposefully continuing to move forward towards a more holistic and less fragmented view of sexual health. Um, and to continue to reframe the, the, the discussion from F only STIs and pregnancy prevention and contraception to kind of this whole idea of well-being. It would also help people kind of understand more pathophysiology too um, and common sexual concerns. So some ideas are a continued discussion of attitudes. I remember when I was a first year, when we first learned about um, how to take a sexual history, uh, we had these small group discussions. And they were great, but what, what might be even more helpful is to continue this examination, to really talk not only about what our concerns are with the sexual history, but to examine our, our own um, personal values and our own sexual health values, possibly with sex educators as facilitators. Um, and talk about an awareness about, um, a focus on awareness and tolerance, which is good, but we need to move beyond that and talk about sex. So one thing which is fairly simple to do is add one additional slide in a larger lecture. So I gave you two examples. Um, in a lecture about HPV and half smears, just add in one fact um, slide about the indications for pap smears for lesbian and for transgender patients. Another example. In a lecture about arthritis, have one or two slides about sexual health considerations, so potential difficulties and even suggestions to enhance pleasure. Um, People with arthritis often can't move or it's painful. What can you do instead? Um, test students on this material. Uh, we all know that if you don't test us, it's really not important in medical school. People are nodding in the back, they're med students. Just give us one or two questions. I can't believe I'm asking for more test questions. Um, small group discussions. Include more patient diversity in cases. So right now, too often what we have is you have the IV drug user. You know exactly what they have. You have the gay man probably going to be HIV AIDS. So, for example, if there's a case about an asthma patient, how is it that he's a gay man? It has nothing to do with the case really at all, but suddenly your kind of uh, students are realizing that there's more to people than just gay man equals HIV AIDS. Or if you want to have a reflection question as the last question in the case um, about whether, about kind of the partner's right to visit in this man in the hospital. Um, more role playing. It sounds like students are feeling not knowledgeable uh, or not comfortable either because of not, lack of knowledge or lack of training. Um, and this is probably for everything but, um, in medical school, but they need practice. So continued role playing, helping students understand what questions do you ask a patient if they have a sexual problem. How do you help? When do you refer? Um, how do you screen for violence? How do you respond if someone says, yes, they, this is a positive screen? Um, and then my last question is, does the Curriculum Without Walls program need to be more explicit? So already there's a lot of, um, a lot of lectures about sexual and reproductive health at Mount Sinai. The course hours devoted to this are much more than in other schools. But are students just not realizing that they're learning this because the, course, the lectures are spread out across so many different courses? Um, so on the, on, on the extreme side of some, someone else's, UMDNJ's um, medical school, they actually have sex week. And what they do is that they have a concentrated one-week session um, in the middle of second year medical school where they learn about many different topics about sexual and reproductive health, 
Um, they practice role playing. They learn the GYN exam and everything. And students remember this because it all happened in one week. So whether we want to go to there, it's a different question. It's a lot of fun, but that's kind of a totally different curriculum. But what might be important is that for the Curriculum Without Walls program, to just keep on pointing out when things are being taught so students realize that they're being taught. Um, so that's pretty much the end of this presentation. I just want to acknowledge several people. Uh, Dr. Jacobs is the PI for the survey. Dr. Lipman is my thesis advisor for my MPH. Um, and Dr. Friedman has been helpful pretty much in teaching me about education and curriculum uh, throughout many of my years at Sinai. Um, Perch uh, has helped with the survey tremendously and um, was the idea for the survey. And then I also want to give um, a lot of acknowledgments to both the students who have helped with the survey and also the students and the advisors who've helped with the, who, who directed and led the elective. So that's about it. Thank you.